On the western shore of Hart Island within the St. Lawrence River, uh, dividing upstate New York from Canada sits Bolt Castle. Uh, hospitality mogul and multimillionaire George Bolt, then proprietor of the world-renowned Waldorf Astoria Hotel, might have heard of it, uh, began construction on the castle at the turn of the 20th century, and boy, oh boy, was it ambitious. Uh, for starters, it was an enormous six-story estate boasting 120 rooms, a drawbridge, its own tunnel system, and a polo pitch. The labor force for the castle alone was in the hundreds. And as you imagine, not a single expense was, expared, was spared in building this castle. Of course, money and manpower were no obstacles for Bolt, uh, especially considering that the castle was designed as a gift for a queen, his wife Louise. Uh, it was to be a grandiose monument to his love for her. Sadly, it would be a monument he'd never complete. In early 1904, a little over three and a half years into the project's development, Bolt telegraphed the, the castle's workers with an order to cease all construction immediately. Louise had suddenly passed away. Heartbroken by this, Bolt abandoned the castle, reportedly refusing to ever step set on, in the castle or in Hart Island ever again. Uh, and he too would die just over a decade later. Thus, what began as a good work and a noble effort would nevertheless remain incomplete. You see, man's greatest endeavors, even in his, his most noble intentions, along with everything else in life, uh, are always and inevitably subject to the sovereign will of God. Even within that lies the unavoidable uncertainty intrinsic to human nature, the fact that we don't even know what we're going to do or if we're going to be willing to do it in the future. King Solomon writes in Proverbs 16:8, the heart of a man plans his ways, but what? The Lord establishes his steps. Additionally, he writes in Proverbs 19:21, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the purpose of the Lord which will prevail. Some intent on commanding their own destinies, uh, this, this prospect is a foolish one, right? Either foolish or frightening. Uh, it's foolish to those who reject and dismiss it, but frightening to those who know it and yet uh, disdain it or deny it. However, for the Apostle Paul, God's ultimate sovereignty and immovable resolve was not a source of terror, but one of tremendous joy and assurance, an assurance he wished to promote in the Philippian saints. Uh, and, and with that being said, please turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter 1. Uh, this morning, we'll be looking primarily at verse 6. However, for the sake of context, I'll be beginning by reading verses 1 through 6. Uh, so again, that's Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. There we read out of the ESV. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. In our verse, verse 6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, how we need to be encouraged, oh, Lord, and how we need your work, oh, Lord, in us. Lord, we thank you that your work is a good work, and we thank you it is a work you begin and you complete, oh, Lord. I pray that you would show and bless your people uh, through an exposition of this text, oh, Father God, that, Lord, I would decrease and you would increase, oh, God. O oh Lord, lead us in your truth, continue to sanctify us, O oh Lord, and may you get all of the glory, O oh Father God. May your name be exalted, for the glory of Christ we pray this, amen. Uh, the title of this sermon is The Finisher, uh, and my aim by this message is twofold. Uh, firstly, I would like to show you the certainty of God's promise to finish his good work in all who believe, and secondly, the necessity of said work in any and all who don't believe. I would like to examine our text again, which is Philippians 1, 6, uh, from three different angles, or rather through three distinct points. Point number one, the certainty. Point number two, the certain he. And then lastly, point number three, a certain we. So let's consider our first point, point number one, the certainty. While each point is going to deal with uh, this singular verse, uh, I want you to take notice of certain words that the Apostle Paul uses 
uh, to convey this truth. And I'll try to emphasize them as we read it together. But again, looking at verse 6 there, we read, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, now, in setting the context here, what you need to realize is that uh, Philippi held a very special place in the Apostle Paul's heart. Uh, aside from his privileged status as a Roman colony, former prominence as a leading city within the district of Macedonia, that's northeastern Greece today, uh, it was also potentially uh, the first place on the continent of Europe wherein the gospel was both preached and re received and believed. Uh, you may recall from the book of Acts chapter 16 that Paul and company, upon arriving there about midway through his second missionary journey, uh, and finding no synagogue, stumbled upon an all-women's prayer meeting down by a nearby river outside of the city. Uh, I suppose the men hadn't received the memo, but uh, there it was. But among these women stood one Lydia, a purple goods merchant from the city of Thyatira that was in Asia Minor, uh, whom the Lord had effectually been drawing to himself, right? Effectually and providentially working things out that she would be in Philippi. Uh, Luke records that though not necessarily a Jew, she was in fact a worshiper of God, but we also read that upon hearing the words of Paul, uh, which would have included, if not entirely consisted of the gospel message, uh, the Lord, quote, opened her heart to pay attention to what was being said. Ears which up until then had been perfectly capable of processing sound waves auditorily were now for the first time perceiving the transcendent and supernatural call of God. Right? A formerly impenetrable heart, a heart of stone, was radically and supernaturally, again, transformed into a soft and, and receptive heart, a heart of flesh. And this was a genuine work of God, uh, God's amazing grace. And this was no doubt a tremendous joy for Paul. Therefore, Philippi uh, was a special place in Paul's heart. Again, first, because it was there that his first convert was, right, in, in, in Europe, and, and ultimately his first European church plant. In addition to this, Paul and Silas's first imprisonment in the city uh, resulted in not only the opening of more hearts, but also in a literal and miraculous opening of their jail cells, right? So it's about midnight in a first century Roman prison, which would make Rikers look like a, a Marriott, uh, and, and things appear bleak. Nevertheless, though having been unjustly beaten and illicitly incarcerated for exercising a slave girl who had been possessed with a spirit of divination, uh, we don't find them complaining, right? What was me? How did I get here? I was only doing good. No, but rather what? praying and singing hymns to God, probably exhorting one another to stand firm in the faith, right? To not lose heart, thanking him for, for God's irrevocable freedom that they have in Christ, even though they're in chains. Uh, and, and all of this, mind you, with an earshot of a captive audience, uh, pun intended. But then again, in a remarkable turn of events comes this massive earthquake, uh, which somehow opens every door and loosens every bond in the entire jail facility. The jailer roused from his slumber, is about ready to take his own life. He's presuming all the prisoners under his charge to have escaped. Uh, but no, they're all accounted for. Every last one, along with Paul and Silas, likely astonished by the witness and also perhaps convicted by the, the message that they were hearing and the things that they were hearing, praying and singing, even though these people were, were here for, for what? Doing good? So trembling with fear, the Philippian jailer himself rushes in and asks the question every evangelist longs to hear, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? To which they confidently reply, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Following this, the jailer and his household are baptized, the missionaries are freed, uh, and thus Philippi was also special to Paul because of the Lord's amazing work therein, both to uh, deliver them from the bonds of prison, but also to deliver men from the bonds and chains of their sin. Lastly, Philippi, though more specifically, the saints at Philippi were special to Paul, and very much so because of the enduring partnership which they had with Paul, uh, both in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, a partnership they maintained, even as we read in verse 5, from the very first day, day one until now. And just to put that in perspective, the book of Philippians was written about 10 to 15 years after the events of Acts chapter 16. So that's after Lydia gets converted, that's after the Philippian jailer, over a decade. Uh, so, by this point, his opponents are many, his close spiritual opinions are few, companions are few. Uh, furthermore, Paul's writing this from yet another prison cell. He's writing to the Philippians from another prison cell, uh, likely the one in Rome from which he would never be entirely free again. Uh, however, the Philippians never abandoned him. In all that time, they never turned their backs on him, right? Their love and concern for him and his well-being always remained. It never waned, 
but it remained and it, and it grew, needing only a, an opportunity for demonstration. Uh, in fact, it's later revealed in chapter 4, verse 18, that he's writing to them at least partly in response to some provisional aid they sent him. They had sent him some gift, and so that's prompting him writing to them. Uh, and uh, therefore, to him, they're, they're valued fellow workers and cherished co-laborers uh, in, uh, in the gospel, in the ministry of the gospel. And this is a sentiment which is implied even at the beginning of the letter. He doesn't open up saying Apostle Paul, right, but rather what? Uh, uh, Apostle Christ. He's saying servant of Christ. Right? He's reminding them of their need to serve one another with such a heart, even as they have faithfully served him in all that time. And what's abundantly clear in all of this is that he cares for them as do they for him. And naturally, uh, this is a cause for great joy. But not only joy, also a cause for great assurance. Paul, as we read, was sure of a certain reality pertaining to the Philippian saints. Uh, this was a reality which was both of pre- then present and also eternal significance for them. And Paul was no fool. He, was, he wasn't quick to believe uh, every and any rumor he heard or any idea he conceived in his, in his mind. This was a man who trained with some of the greatest minds in Judea, right? He, he, uh, after planting the church in Philippi, not long after that, he would go toe-to-toe with rabbis, philosophers, civil magistrates, responding to every lofty argument and every oppositional uh, uh, thought by taking it captive to the obedience of Christ. And though he was not without certain weaknesses, right, at least from a cursory observation, if there were ever an apostle you would try to get one over on, it wouldn't be the apostle Paul. Even Peter admitted that some of his letters were hard to understand, but not because of any incoherence, but because of their, their rich and deep spiritual profundity. Right? And understand this, this sureness that Paul had concerning the Philippians, it wasn't merely wishful thinking, like, yeah, I just really like them, and yeah, I just think the best. No, it, it wasn't a holy hoping for the best. What Paul had was a deep-rooted confidence which can only come about by reason of careful persuasion. In fact, the Greek word used here, patho, which many of our English Bible uh, translations read as sure, confident, or certain, can also mean trust, convinced, or persuaded. See, Paul was absolutely persuaded that there would be an enduring finality to God's good work in their lives. The same way he was persuaded in Romans 8, 38, for example, and 39, that neither life nor death, quote, angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation would be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord, right? And in this, he was not without justification. He was perfectly justified in this thinking, as he would go on to immediately say in verse 7, right? He says in verse 7, it is right for me to feel this way about you. Why, Paul? Because I hold you in my heart, for you are partakers of me of both grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. And they were partakers with him of grace. He kind of spells it out right there. They enjoyed fellowship with him in in, in grace. He loved them, and in keeping with said love, he resolved to bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. 1 Corinthians 13, 17. Furthermore, he was witness to the abundant fruit they bore for Christ, constantly reminding them of their faithful obedience up until that point, right? How he helped them uh, in the past, all throughout, from the, from the first day. Thus, with all of the evidence weighed, not a single thought, whether intrusive or otherwise, would reverse his conclusion concerning them. And believe me, there are many things which could have reversed that conclusion, right? That could have made him uncertain. For starters, there was his situation. As I mentioned previously, Paul was in prison, uh, once again, likely under house arrest in Rome, and, and though it probably wasn't his worst stint, historically speaking, at, least, at this point, he wasn't a spring chicken either. This was sort of towards the end of his life. Uh, and, and, and add to that a life of consistent, spiritual, uh, mental, physical, emotional suffering, the likes of which would probably appall and grieve us if we knew him personally. Uh, it, it's a wonder he never threw in the towel. Because you've got to believe stuff like that, it takes its toll, right? I mean, when he himself writes about his afflictions to the Corinthian church, he says in 2 Corinthians 1.8, he keeps it real with them about how they were so utterly burdened beyond their strength that what? They despaired of life itself. What are you, what are you saying, Paul? What I'm saying is that there were times that it was so bad that I just wish I was dead. It would have been more preferable to this. And if you've been following with us the past few weeks that Pastor Pete's been preaching through 2 Corinthians, then you know... Uh, just what kind of afflictions that Paul was talking about. Of course, I'm fully aware of the fact that God deals with each of his children in, in various ways, uniquely. 
Right? Some possess varied measures of faith with greater or lesser capacities for suffering and endurance than others. And this is especially given, uh, true given the fact that uh, we are each at different points in our sanctification and in our, in our spiritual maturity. However, I don't believe the Apostle Paul is writing in vain because in this letter, on at least four separate occasions alone, he, he, he explicitly or implicitly exhorts them to what? Follow his example. Follow, follow my example. The imprisonments, the beatings, the suffering, the endurance, follow my example, the example that you have in Timothy, the example that you have in Epaphroditus. So for one, we need to ask ourselves, what do I suffer for Christ? Sure, in this land it may not be prison yet, uh, but what about relationships? Jesus said in both Matthew 10 and Luke 12 that he came not to bring peace, but a sword. Even one that divides households, it's going to split brothers against sisters, you know, children against parents, all that. What about comforts, possessions, worldly goods, and in worldly ambition? You know, everyone wants to make something of their lives. That's the model of the world, right? Uh, but no one wants to lose their lives. And I don't mean that like in a morbid way, but in a biblical one. In Mark 10, 29 to 30, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who what? Will not receive a hundredfold now in this time all of those things, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and lands, with persecutions, and then in the age to come, eternal life. What has and or is following Christ costing you today? What is it costing you personally? You know, more importantly, how do we view our suffering? Is it, is it just a nuisance, something that we just want to, we can't wait to get off of our plate? Uh, or is it seen as a gracious and sanctifying tool which the Lord is, is lovingly using to mature us, to bring us more and closer to that image of Christ. He's using it to perfect you. Another potential threat to Paul's sureness was distance, right? They say distance makes the heart grow fonder. And perhaps that's true in some circumstances if the heart's right. But a different adage says, out of sight, out of mind. And yet another says, no news is good news. And sadly, I've been guilty of that line of thinking, even with my own family, more often than I would like to admit. Uh, and care to count. And, and, and it's in those moments that I need to remember precisely what Paul tells the Philippians in the following chapter, right? In Philippians chapter 2. And what does he tell them? Think like Jesus. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Think like Jesus. How did Jesus think? He esteemed the interests of others more highly than himself, chiefly. Therefore, he didn't himself tolerate selfish ambition, conceit, or complacency, Right? Paul, being physically in Rome, was over 750 miles from the brethren at Philippi. That's roughly 100 times as far from them as we are from North Shore, Lindbrook, Woodside. And yet he was entirely willing and expecting to make that trip if, if he, by God's grace, was able to get out of prison. Now, mind you, travel back then wasn't easy. Consider the perils. You had bandits, you had shipwrecks, you had sickness and a host of other things. And remember, there were no cars, trains, buses, or airlines. Uh, not to mention the, the obvious fact that the, all of this took place in the age before the telegram, before Instagram, before anything like that. Uh, and even though, even still, though miles apart, he continues to remember them, right, by name. He talks about Clement, he talks about Leodia, Syndicate, he talks about the saints there, and he knows them by name, intimately. He holds them in his heart, which verse 7 says, right, which we read. He says also that he yearned for them with the affection of Christ Jesus. What does that even mean? What does that even look like? What is he saying there? He calls them his crown in joy, and he encourages them to share in his joy. Not some of them, but all of them. The ones he hadn't seen in a long time, as well as the ones he probably never meet in this life. Uh, and, and though he could have benefited from the practical uh, uh, blessing and encouragement and comfort of, of Timothy and Epaphroditus, he, he doesn't hoard them for himself back in, back in his Roman jail cell. He, he, he's sending them to them. Why? So that they can be an encouragement to them and so that the saints there could reap the benefits of, 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 of these men, having a godly example in these men. What about us? Does distance move our heart to fondness or to coldness and apathy? Right? Does, it, does distance make us yearn or does it make us quick to forget? Do we remember, rejoice over, and pray for the brethren who moved away or who become ill and can no longer meet with us on a regular basis? Do we make efforts to reach out to them? I love some of the saints that are going, many, some of you here may not know Angela Braxton, but she was a dear sister 
uh, who's among us for many years, dear, near and dear to my heart, and I, I know many brothers and sisters go out to meet her. Right now, she, she has dementia, and so she can't meet with us. But it's a great encouragement and blessing to know that many of our brothers and sisters go out to, to see and spend time with her and, and, and pray over her and sing with her, even, even in her mental state. Do we do that with each other even right here, though? I know I need major work in this area, so may God move us and help us uh, to, to, to love one another, not only in word, but also in deed. But whether it be distance or situation, right, neither of these things were about to diminish the confidence that Paul had in uh, the Philippians' assured salvation. And the, the reason why it wasn't going to diminish that confidence was not found in them, but in he, the, in the he who was faithfully working in them. Which brings us to our next point, point number two, the certain he. Uh, looking again at our verse, we read, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Right, as self-sufficient as we often like to think that we are, we think we can just do it all ourselves, we need no one's help, no one's advice or counsel, uh, it's not that way, right? Uh, Especially when we need to get a job done, we may think this way. I, I, I mean, at work, this is, I'm preaching to myself, right? For me, as an apprentice elevator mechanic, all I think I need is my tools, my strength, maybe my team every now and then. Uh, for soldiers, I suppose it's their weapons, their armor, you know, and maybe their comrades. Uh, and this is, of course, entirely normal for finite creatures such as we, right? We're fraught with natural limitations. We can't be two places at once. We can't do everything. Uh, yes. Right? But the reality of it in all this is, in, in this life, we need help. We need help to do so many things. Uh, and thankfully, there are many things which God has providentially designed for that purpose, so that we would have aid. But if this is true of our everyday resources, you know, how much more sure can we be that the one with whom all power and authority in this universe rests is able to help us in our sanctification and complete what he started? That's the greatest help. Consider what the psalmist writes in view of Mount Zion concerning this sure hope. Uh, turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles. It's the only time we're going to turn anywhere else. To Psalm chapter 121. Uh, psalm chapter 121 uh, is a psalm of ascent. Uh, and in this psalm, the human author whose identity remains unknown to us, he has in mind Jerusalem, right? This is an Old Testament uh, sort of situation. He has in mind Jerusalem, which was a special place to God's old covenant people. It was a place in which God chose to, in a special, very special way, meet and dwell amongst his people, right? It's, why the, it's where the temple was. The psalmist, uh, um, or certainly the people who would have sung this psalm as they were traveling, uh, are likely on pilgrimage to the city for one of the three major Jewish festivals. And as they're approaching the city gates, beginning to ascend that hilly terrain, they're perhaps reflecting on uh, the hardships and the challenge they faced over that year or over the last time since they've gone to Jerusalem. Uh, these hardships, whether by nature or providence, have the potential to, to rock one's faith. We, we considered some of the potential uh, things that could have rocked Paul's faith, his imprisonment, his distance. Uh, you know, the fact that he couldn't be there. He didn't know necessarily what was happening at any given time, right? And perhaps uh, the psalmist, or the one singing this psalm, is thinking about all of these things in my life, my trials, my struggles, what I lost. But the psalmist knows better. He doesn't look inward as if there were anything in himself that could deliver, but upward. Consider what he writes, Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil, he will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in. For how long? From this time forth and forevermore. The Lord is amazing, is he not? He, he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He's the finisher, right? When he created the heavens and the earth, he didn't, he didn't stop halfway, right? He didn't leave it half done. When he brought his people out of Egypt by the Red Sea through the wilderness and ultimately into the promised land, the land he promised to give to their fathers, he didn't take a break or reconsider, and, and certainly he could have, how disobedient they were, right? But he didn't. He, he didn't go back to the drawing board. He didn't scrap the project altogether. 
Rather, in faithfulness to himself by whom he swore and also in, in just boundless love for his people, he faithfully saw them through, all the way through to the very end. And we can even see this from the fall to redemption, right? He finished what he began. In Genesis 3, at the fall of mankind, God is pronouncing judgment to, to, to the, the three uh, sort of uh, um, offending parties, Adam, Eve, and, and, and the serpent. And even then, with that judgment, there was also a promise of future hope and, 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 and sure fulfillment. And God said to the serpent in Genesis 3.15, a familiar verse as well, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is an early allusion to the long-awaited Messiah, right? This is a testament to God's faithfulness. This Messiah wouldn't come for another 4,000 years from that point, give or take. But it was, he would surely come. Though Christ, do Christ's substitutionary and sacrificial atonement, the fact that he takes our sin, he pays for it, he would crush the power of Satan, and he would, he would completely undo the curse of sin that lies on us for all who put their trust in him. And in light of this, Paul possessed that same certainty. He knew the power of God to preserve. He also knew the character of God, a God who loves his people with an everlasting love from this time forth and forevermore, the psalmist said, right? Not just when I feel like it or if you're doing okay. It wasn't contingent on, their, on, on them. He is the one who began the good work in the Philippians and he was the same one who would finish the same in them. But what is this good work exactly? And what makes it good? Paul is describing a supernatural ergon is the Greek word. That is an action, a deed, a task, or a work of which God is intrinsically agathon, good, good in nature, objectively good, whether it's perceived so or not. And this is the same good which he describes in Romans 8, 28, towards which God works all things, right, for, for those who are called according to the purpose, those that, those that love him. It's that same good. And we see there... Uh, in, in what is often referred to as the golden chain of salvation, uh, that this work consists of the believer's sanctification. And, and a brief biblical d definition of sanctification might be the Holy Spirit's work of setting believers apart, right? That's what it means to be holy, setting believers apart, to be made like God. Whereas we were once like our former father, the devil, like Satan, following after his devices and just doing whatever we wanted, God has begun a process in which he is now actively making us new for those of us who are his. Sanctification is a three-phase process. In the moment of salvation, Christians enter sanctification, but they enter it positionally. As the Philippian jailer took Paul and Silas' advice to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and thank God he did, the man was there and then made positionally holy, positionally righteous, uh, Jesus' work on the cross is a finished work. Therefore, believers stand positionally sanctified uh, it, it, before God. And that's a great blessing, right? It, it shows that we're, the work is done. It's, we're planted. We're established in him. Even though they are not yet completely holy in practice, those who are positionally sanctified are secure. The author of Hebrews spells, he, he spells this out. He crystallizes this very well in Hebrews 10, 14. For by a single offering, he, Jesus, has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now, when we think of sanctification, often what we have in mind is the, the second phase, phase two, progressive sanctification. Right? That, that's what's happening now. This is the process by which God, who begun the good work in us, at salvation continues, faithfully continues, to transform us into the image of his son, liberating us from both the, the, the practices and the power of sin. Right? Sin is sin's losing its power day by day as we're being made more like Christ. After our initial cleansing, the committed Christian begins to undergo a, a daily process, and big emphasis on daily, this is something that day by day happens. Uh, a daily process of spiritual renewal, of which Paul speaks in Colossians 3.10, for example, the Bible also calls this phase the sanctifying work of the Spirit, as the Holy Spirit is the chief agent here working in us to, to, to uh, produce the character of God and the fruit of holiness. From the moment God begins his work in us until the, the last day, the day of its completion, the Holy Spirit is, is chipping away, he's renovating, sculpting, and daily reforming us, pruning us into partakers of this holy nature of God of, in Christ. Therefore, God is that certain he. He's the one that's doing it. It's not us. 
but him. He's the one who both begins and completes the work in an ultimate sense. However, believers are also meant not to be passive in this, this process, but also active, yielding to the effort, contributing to that. Again, we don't contribute to that first part. God makes us positionally good. He makes us positionally righteous. But now as we are progressing towards that, he, he calls for us to comply. Pastor Pete read this earlier, but again, consider what the Paul tells the Philippians in the following chapter, Philippians 2, 12 to 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have also obeyed, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my, pre- in my presence, but more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do, to will and to work for his good pleasure. Paul, he would go on in the following chapter to renounce his his fleshly and worldly accolades, all of the things that made him the greatest uh, in chapter 3. And he writes concerning himself, not that I have already obtained this, what's this, perfection, glorification, resurrection from the dead, or I'm already perfect. He's saying he's not perfect. But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have attained, Philippians 3, 12 to 16. All right, so began, God began this good work in us at salvation. And he, he, but he's then called us to live out what he's worked in. He calls us to work out what he's worked in, in this progressive development, uh, as we're being made into the image of Christ. Because uh, the Christian's walk is, 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 a path, is a pathway of ongoing growth. It's, it's not something in which we plateau or remain stagnant, but God wants us to continue to grow, to can, continue to bear fruit. And he's going to be with us, but we, we have to be obedient. The question is, do, do we see this growth in ourselves? Do you see this growth in yourself? Do I see it in me? If in yourself you do, praise the Lord, but don't get, don't get comfortable. Press on. Paul says, I press on. I strive. He's being stretched out. He, he's, not, he's not settling. Don't become lax. Don't rest in your laurels. Don't look, yeah, I did that. I, yeah, I remember back in the day, I was just so hot, and I know that's, that's what's, that's what's going to get me in. Don't, don't think like that. Right? Instead, like spiritual exercise, if any of you go to the gym or worked out any time in the past, continue to work out. Because you know you need to continue to make those gains or you need to continue to maintain what you have. Right? With fear and trembling, uh, which, is, which God has so graciously worked into you. Right? If you see this progression in others, um, encourage them. Don't become envious. Don't be salty. Encourage them. Show them what you've seen. We're, we're called to encourage each other. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is, this is, after all, the reason why we meet. Hebrews 10.25. This is one of the primary reasons we gather together, and it's why we're here. Uh, so let us encourage one another, and let us run this race. And this journey is bringing us ever closer to God until his work is perfect and complete. God is not bringing us to 80%. He's, he's bringing us all the way. Uh, this is the third phase of sanctification. It's also known as glorification. And this completion will take place at or until the day of Christ Jesus, our Lord, right? That is the day of Christ's return, when we finally see him face to face, when we finally meet him, the one that we've been praying to, praising, serving, getting to know intimately, we finally see him in the flesh. From the very beginning, throughout the continuation and until the final show, God is working in us. He is the master craftsman, the master mechanic who who never gives up on us. The Lord's salvation, his glorious redemption of his people will, not may, but will reach its crowning culmination because he's faithful. And this will happen when Jesus Christ returns. He may come at any moment, but we know at that moment it will be complete. Only then will God, who has begun a good work in you, uh, put his finishing touch on you and on you, which brings us to our final point, point number three, a certain we. We looked at the certainty the certain he, and now lastly, point number three, the, a certain we. There again we read, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Paul was certain that the saints, and again, all of the saints, would come marching in. Right? He was certain 
like David in Psalm 16, that they were the excellent ones in the land in whom is all his delight. They were, again, his crown and joy. And yet their excellence was not predicated on anything in themselves. It wasn't because they were so great. It wasn't because of, you know, all the things that they had done, even their proven character, which he was greatly blessed by. But that wasn't the reason why they were going to make it in. Right? It wasn't their performance. But rather by the grace of God within them. Because God so loved them, they would surely finish the race. They would make it through. And you know, often, I was just talking about a brother, with this with a brother earlier today. When reflecting on God's everlasting love for me personally, I don't know if you've ever felt this way, I'm simply amazed and sometimes bewildered. And I think to myself, how? Why? You know, like, I, why would a God as holy and righteous as the God we know love, endure, deal, and be patient with me in all my sin, in all my failings, in all the times that I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do better, and I failed? Why would he continue to, to endure with, with any of us, right, whose best works are like filthy rags? Paul in Romans 7, he says himself, we, we cry wretched men that, that we are when we, when we compare ourselves to God's standard and the fact that, like, we're not where we want to be. And we think this way, especially when we think about how difficult it is to sometimes live upright for God in this fallen world. And I thought on occasion whether or not if I was in the position of judge, which is a, it's a vain thought, but I, I thought that if I'd be able to endure with myself, right? If I was the one looking down, seeing this, you know, would I, would I say, that's it, you're done? Or would I continue to endure? I, I think about how fickle my love is at times, right? And how inconsistent I've been in my commitments. Uh, the very thought of commitment today is, is virtually a taboo in our society. We don't even like to think of it, especially if it's self-sacrifice for others. We want to glorify ourselves. But then, and this is, this is the game changer, this is what turns it around. When we look at God and we remember that his ways are not like our ways, remember he's not like us. His ways are far and exceedingly above our ways, even in the way he chooses to view those who are poor in spirit, right? Who mourn over sin with a broken and a contrite heart. What does the scripture say? He will not despise. Scripture tells us that a heart like that, he won't despise. And, and brothers and sisters, how thankful ought we to be that our God is truly faithful? Where would we be? If it had not been for the Lord, where would we be if not for his steadfast love? If he said at one point, you know what? You had three strikes, you're out. Where would we be? If not for his steadfast love and abundant mercy over us. Because even in our best days, right, in and of ourselves, we're no more, we're, we're no more worthy, acceptable, or or desirable to God than we are on our, on our worst days. But at the same time, we're also no less. Right? The love of God, as, as we sung that will not let us go, we sang a, a different rendition of it today, but I, I love that hymn, uh, is, is even in our greatest hours of weakness, uh, failure, shortcomings, he's no less able to sustain our weary souls than we are when we're on the mass mountaintops. He sustains our weary souls. Right? And is that not an encouraging thought? Is that not something that should keep us going? What does that mean, practically speaking? What, is, what does this mean? How then should we then live? What that means is uh, that right now, as weak as you may be or you may think you are, uh, that's not where you're going to be for long. If you're in Christ, that's not where you're going to stay. Only you must abide in Christ. What does he say of himself in John 15? Right? He is the true vine, apart from which we as the branches, we can do nothing. We can't do anything apart from him. He said that the Father is glorified in us when we do what? When we bear much fruit for him. And he's, he's implying that we will bear much fruit for him because we will abide in him, because we will remain in him, because we will want to live for him. Beloved, let us glorify God with our conduct. Right? Let us love one another. Let us follow in the Philippians examples and in the examples Paul laid out. Right? Let us support and confirm uh, and defend the gospel ministry. Let us support those missionaries. We think of Kelvin in the DR. We think of our brother and sister Gideon and Ariel who are going out. Let us support them as they continue to do the work in ministry of, of, the, of the ministry in foreign lands, practically. Let us love one another. Be patient with one another. Right? If God is patient with us, if he's seeing us through, how can we not be patient with one another? Sure, we may have different temperaments. We may not always see eye to eye on things, but if we're God's people, we're God's children. We're brothers and sisters. We're family. How can we not endure with family? <laughs> you 
Let us, like Paul, press on towards the upward call of God in Christ, the same way Paul and the Philippians did. Now, as I said at the onset, the purpose of my message was twofold. Right? I wanted to give you the certainty for you who believe of your assured salvation based on God's work, based on God's good work. But also a word of warning for any who remain in unbelief, who choose to willfully reject and, and turn away and, and lay aside this, this word and this, this, this awesome reality. Right? What can be said about the day of Christ Jesus? We look at that at the end of the verse. To merely say it's an important day would be a gross understatement. Yeah, it's important, sure, absolutely. Even still, besides the crucifixion, it's arguably one of the, the, the most significant days in all of history because it's on that day history is going to come to its climactic conclusion. When Christ is going to return, right? The one to whom all authority on heaven and earth has been given, he is going to be standing as judge. He's been for ages patiently waiting and biding his time until his enemies are going to be made a footstool for his feet. No one is going to escape this day. No one's going to skirt by. No one's going to get around God's judgment. Right? The scrolls are going to be open. Every sin, every evil thought will be brought to account. Hebrews 4.13 tells us that. Uh, it, for some, it will be a, joy, a joyous and yet awesome and sort of fearful day um, in the truest sense of that word for God's chosen few, right? But also for others, it's going to be an inconceivably dreadful day, the worst day you could ever imagine. You say that's the worst day I ever had in life, and you don't know the worst day until that last day if you're not in Christ. If you've, been, if you've spent your life rejecting him, you've got to know that that's not going to last forever. You're not going to escape. I beg of you, don't let this be you. Don't let these words just pass idly by. If you don't know Christ, if you haven't repented of your sins, and what it means to repent is to change your mind. Change your mind about what? About God, about your sin, about Jesus, about his righteous requirement, about your, 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 your sinful, the fact that you are depraved and you need him. You need to change your mind and you need to turn to him. You need to confess to him your sins. You need to trust in him and you need to know that he will hear that. He will hear and honor and, and, and deliver you just as he delivered Paul and Silas from that jail, just as he delivered Lydia, just as he delivered the Philippian jailer, just as he delivers people all over the world even this day. Today is the day of salvation. Don't let this pass by. You want to be the one who is completed by God. You want to be the one whose good work is in you and will remain in you and will see you across the finish line. If, if, if you're confused about these things, if you're, if you're not sure, see me after, see Pastor Pete, see Pastor Nick. Uh, we'd love to, to talk, or some of the other brothers here, we'd love to, to talk to you and try to encourage you uh, in what you need. But you need Christ. You need to believe on the one who came, whom God sent, who took on flesh to pay for the sins of those who are of but flesh, men, who hung on that cross, who died, paying for the sins of all who would believe in him, who rose from the dead, vindicating his message and, and, and showing forth the glory of God and who now reigns victorious and who's going to come again. May you be found in him by that day and may you be complete. And for those of you, again, who are in Christ, rest, rest assured, yet eagerly and expectantly and, and with great love and zeal, rest in that day because you are in him and because where you are now is not where you're going to be when he takes you home. Um, let's pray. Father God, Lord, thank you. Lord, you're not like us. Thank you that you remain. Thank you that you are faithful. And thank you that in your faithfulness we can be encouraged not to be laxed, but to press on, oh Lord, to live more holy and righteous and pleasing and acceptable to you, not, not because we think we're uh, earning your favor or retaining your favor, but because we want to please you and honor you because you have done the work for us. You are doing the work in us, O oh God, and you shall complete it in us, O oh Lord. O oh Father God, may we be all the more empowered this day and, and forevermore to abide in your love, O oh God. Oh Lord, bless your people here and save those who are not yours, O oh God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.